All right. Well, we continue through Esther. Why don't you grab your Bible, turn with me to Esther chapter 4. Here's where we get into kind of the amazing part of this story. It's, it's, uh, we left everybody kind of hanging on Sunday where um, the story's kind of picked up to a feverish problem, really. Um, and, you know, just a quick review, if you're just joining us. Uh, of course, we started off with the characters, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, same guy, depending on what translation you're reading. Uh, and his, his wife was Queen Vashti. But after 180 days of partying and they wanted to bring in Queen Vashti, you know, and this whole immoral kind of, you know, display of his queen, she refused. And so they excommunicated her from the kingdom. And they ran a big beauty contest uh, there in the kingdom of Persia, which really at that time covered all the way from, um, you know, India all the way westerly toward even Ethiopia and northern Africa. And so it was a huge kingdom uh, that Xerxes was a powerful king, really. But um, long story short, I got, yeah, a guy named Mordecai, uh, a little Jewish dude, and I say little, I'll tell you why in a second. But um, he, he was raising his cousin, Esther, who was an orphan. He raised her as his own. And she was chosen to be in the beauty contest. And, you know, the story is she uh, knocked him over, bowled him over with her beauty, both inward and outward beauty. And we saw where she was chosen. And now she's the queen. But then you've got the bad guy in the story. uh, And his name is Haman. Uh, His name, by the way, means magnificent. Hmm. We'll see. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but Mr. Magnificent Haman, well, he's not so. He's, he's actually a weasel, and he's a loser, and we'll see how that shakes out. Well, we've already seen some of it. Um, when, when Haman was made second in command over the kingdom, he would ride through the gates of the city and never bow down and, you know, observe, you know, his, his magnificence and sort of worship him kind of thing. But Mordecai, the Jew, refused and wouldn't bow down and worship him. And so Haman, you know, as the, as the way of the Medes and the Persians, they would make up laws that even the king had to obey the laws. Once it was signed into a law, uh, it was a constitutional monarchy, and that's the way it worked. So Haman, you know, contrived a plan to make a law that in one year's time, every Jew would be slaughtered. You could kill them with a sword on a certain day and take their homes, all their possessions, And again, we looked at that on Sunday, you know, another attempt at extermination of the Jewish people. And we talked about the Holocaust and all that last Sunday. And and that's kind of where we left the story hanging, where um, Haman got his law signed one year uh, away, the Jews would all be slaughtered. Um, Meanwhile, Ahasuerus is like, or Xerxes, whatever you want to call him, he's like, yeah, whatever, cool, whatever you think's right, right, Haman, you do that. So then we find them, you know, kind of at the end of the story uh, on Sunday, uh, he, the king and Haman are sitting down and having a drink. And they're like, cool, we got all this done. Jews will be dead in a year. Awesome. Everybody else was perplexed. And we saw how when, uh, throughout the ages when the Jews have been, you know, uh, the target of demise, the rest of the world kind of goes, yeah, okay, well, we're perplexed. We don't get Hitler, but oh well, glad it's not us. And that's, that's largely the way the world has handled you know, this kind of ethnic cleansing of the Jews throughout the ages. And it's, um, it's a pretty bad story in history. And so now, uh, we've, you know, the Jews, there was a writing that went out throughout all the region saying this will happen, you know, in one year, all the Jews will be killed. Meanwhile, back at the palace, Esther, she's pretty isolated from these writings and decrees and her own people. And she has continued to listen to her cousin's advice not to reveal her ethnic identity, that she didn't tell anybody she was a Jew. Uh, They don't know that yet. But they do know Mordecai's a Jew because he won't bow down to Haman. And it's because he's a Jew he won't do this. And so we find now uh, where we pick up this story um, now, don't, don't forget, there's a few things you've got to remember about the story that we may, may forget. Um, if you recall, um, uh, Mordecai, uh, years earlier, exposed an, an assassination plot against Ahasuerus the king. If you remember, Big Dan and Tiresh, um, you know, they were, they'd, they'd plotted to murder, to assassinate the king. And, and it was Mordecai who brought it to the king's attention. And, you know, they ended up killing those two guys. But they kind of forgot about that. Everybody forgot about Mordecai saving the king. And, um, and so um, Mordecai kind of goes down as nobody really famous or anything. But Haman hates Mordecai and wants him to bow down before him. So on the 13th day of Adar, that's when the Jews would be all slaughtered 
uh, which would be our time somewhere around March usually is when that took place. So um, we pick it up now in chapter four. Let's read and see what happens as Mordecai and the Jews are facing certain doom. It says in verse one of chapter four, when Mordecai perceived that all was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. So, you know, sackcloth was that kind of prickly gunny sack type clothing the Jews would put on when they were mourning or grieving. And so, um, you know, now he's there at the king's gate where you're not supposed to be wearing sackcloth, but he's making a scene uh, because the Jews are going to be slaughtered. Uh, What does he have to lose, you know? And so it says in verse 3, And in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Um, So, um, you know, this, this is that outward sign of their grief that they would show. And even to this day, the Jews show their grief in a different way than typical Americans, uh, very expressive in their wailing and weeping, and, and it's kind of their way. But this being demonstrated throughout all the land. Um, notice it says here that they were fasting. And you and I might just knee-jerk say, oh, that's great, they're praying and fasting. It's possible. But it's interesting, the Bible doesn't say praying. Um, The book of Esther is unique in that it doesn't speak of the Lord not one time. And it doesn't speak of prayer. It does speak of fasting. So that's the question. Were they fasting in prayer? And and here's the thing I want to point out because the question sort of in the debate goes on and you can read different commentaries and different views on, you know, was Mordecai a, a solid believer in God? And was he, and the Jews, were they fasting and praying before the Lord? Um, that's the one argument. The, the other argument is, um, why don't you guys go ahead and lower the, the blind over there because these guys are getting a little suntan over here. Can you guys see me? Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that we can help them out a little bit. Um, and so um, the question is, were they really praying? And, and um, we don't really know for sure. It, it, it might just be um, that these guys had some hints of God's providence and, you know, God doing uh, what he uh, was doing through, you know, not, you know, con- uh, what's the word? Uh, con- um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, you know, where it just accidentally happens versus God's, yes, God's intervention, his, his, his practical intervention and his sovereignty. Um, and so that's the big question was, is God sovereign? And did the Jews recognize that or was it just kind of God out there? See, here's the reason this is interesting to me, because if you study some of our early fathers of our country, um, you know, some of them didn't really claim as much to be Christians. Now, let me say this, um, that's way over, uh, overused. You know, that you'll hear college presidents, none of the founding fathers of this nation were really Christians. And they'll make up a bunch of weird stuff about how they were just deists or they only believed in providence and what have you. And um, the truth is, um, most of them were uh, sold out believers in the Bible and followers of Jesus Christ. That's just the truth of history. Um, But even Benjamin Franklin, who often gets that, you know, rap that he was not really a Christian, and that may be true, but it's interesting because he has things that he said about his belief in God. And it's kind of an interesting thing. And, and virtually all of them believed in God's providence. And they used that word a lot, provision from God. And it wasn't coincidence that it was all providence. And, and the United States becoming a nation was all part of God's providence. And they thanked the Lord for his, uh, you know, shedding his grace upon this nation. Don't let them reteach or rewrite history on that. Um, don't get me started. I've got all kinds of quotes from the founding fathers who sound more Christian than you and me. And the atheists and the people are trying to erase that part of our nation's history that we really were a nation founded on godly principles and used much of the Bible to sort of uh, help us understand what should be in the Constitution um, and and all that. So, uh, but, but what's interesting is I see a little bit of a similarity in the way the word providence is tossed around in our early founding fathers as I do here in the story of Esther. And could it be, just something to think about, that the Jews had been far from Jerusalem for so many years now, 
Um, you know, over a hundred years, the Jews have been away from Jerusalem. They weren't worshiping in the temple. Um, the question is, what was their walk with God like? When they were fasting, they knew that, okay, you're supposed to fast when you're in trouble, but did they know that prayer was part of that too? It's interesting to me that it's not mentioned in context of fasting here. It's just, they were fasting. They knew that's something they're supposed to do. And they're not gonna ever mention God. Mordecai's not gonna talk about God. Esther's not gonna talk about God. But they're gonna talk about sort of how the Jews, they just sort of know there's something that's gonna protect them. And they don't even really call it God. The reason I'm I'm pointing that out is because um, maybe their understanding of who Jehovah was to the Jews had been somewhat forgotten. That's, that's the truth of the matter. Well, Brett, then why does God help him? See, that's the beauty of it. That's why if that's true, that the, the Jews had largely forgotten and they become more Persian than they were Jews. And, and after all, you know, Esther fits right in. Mordecai fit in as one of the gang until he wouldn't bow down to Haman. And they said, oh, okay, he's a Jew because he won't bow down. It's, I wonder if these guys started looking, you know, like the Persians, acting, sort of walking in a way that would sort of uh, just fit right in. But, but it's funny, God says, I am not going to let my people be destroyed. And it's God's provision and his sovereignty. And that's what I think Mordecai, minimally, Mordecai's acknowledging that. Um, and some people say, well, Brett, that's not giving Mordecai enough credit or Esther enough credit for their radical faith and trust in the Lord. It doesn't say anything about their radical faith or trust in the Lord. But we see bravery, courage, and, and a little bit of a hint that they know that perhaps God um, is sovereign and that he's going to help them. Uh, it's very minimal what we have for Esther and for Mordecai. Um, you say, that's a bummer. No, I think it shows God's great mercy and his grace and how he saves people. Even when we're far away, the Lord is quick to save. Um, and uh, I think that's actually a, a neat part of the story, if you ask me. Um, so people uh, wonder, why did they leave out God of the book of Esther? It's the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God in any way, shape, or form. I think it's part of the story, that the Jews were living in a very strange place, and they'd been living there for a long time. And perhaps the influence had made them sort of forget who they really were and what fasting perhaps even meant. But, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. People ask me from time to time, Brett, you know, when, what, what's going to happen to the pygmies out in the jungles of Papua New Guinea when the rapture of the church happens or when the judgment day comes, when they stand before the throne, you know, of God? Uh, what's going to happen to the pygmies? Because, you know, there's still people over there that never had a missionary come and tell them about Jesus dying on the cross for their sins. Um, will they be saved? And the answer is, I don't know. But God knows. And I have a hunch that to whom much is given, much is required. If you are like us, who have access to all kinds of information and the gospel and the Bible, then we'll be required to accept and know Jesus, God's only begotten son, and it's part of what we are required to do, accept and believe. But perhaps there, um, with the pygmies, whatever they've been given, if they uh, attribute the sunshine that they enjoy on the beach there in Papua New Guinea, and they say, that's the sun God, then maybe that's in their own way, rebellion against the true and living God. Romans chapter one and two sort of implies that even creation will indict people who don't believe. So, um, but what if the pygmy says, I believe that there's someone greater that gives us that sunshine. I wonder if the Lord, because of what they've not been given, not as much will be required of them in the same way that you and I are required much. Does that make sense? So I don't know the answer of who's saved in the pygmy world, but... I do know that God is gracious and his mercy endures forever. And I think that that's one of the great hopes that the the pygmies who never got the gospel. Now, it's becoming rare, by the way, any place in the world that has never heard the gospel. That's almost unheard of anymore. The gospel has reached far and wide throughout all the the nations of the world, largely. So, uh, but be that as it may, the Jews are kind of at that place where they, they perhaps have long forgotten what it was like to be close and really walk with the Lord. Um, So all that to say, uh, they're fasting and mourning, um, but what is that fasting and wailing all about? Not really sure. Maybe that's just all they know what to do. Um, Whether it was prayer or not, that's for you to decide and for us to ask Esther and Mordecai when we get to heaven. So verse four, so Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her, you know, that Mordecai was out there mourning and, you know, weeping in sackcloth in the king's gate. Um, So then the queen was exceedingly grieved and she, she sent raiment 
or you know, to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. See, Esther doesn't know what's going on. She didn't get the memo that death to the Jews was the mantra of the day. She's like, you know, cuz, man, you gotta put on some clothes. Here's some nice clothes for you, Mordecai. Put some nice clothes on. What's wrong? But Mordecai wouldn't put on those clothes. Then verse five, then called Esther for um, Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, um, whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. Well, what's going on with Mordecai? Go find out, she says. So verse six, Hatak went forth to Mordecai and to the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had uh, happened unto him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also how he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king and make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Okay, so now uh, Esther's given actually one of the, you know, they, they sent out all those, you know, leaflets throughout all the kingdom saying, on this date, you can kill all the Jews and take all their possessions. That's the law. You have to do it. So she gets one of these pamphlets or, you know, leaflets from Mordecai through this chamberlain. And now she knows the problem. And Mordecai tells her, you got to do something. Esther, you got to talk to the king. So... It says in verse 10, and again, Esther spake to Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai and all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces. Do know that whosoever, uh, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king and to the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live but I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. What's that? Well, the laws of Xerxes and the Medes and the Persians was you can't go just say hi to the king, even if you're his wife, unless you're called. And if you just show up saying, I want to see the king and you go in there, then you're putting your life in the king's hands and he could say off with your head if he wants to. That's the law. Um, it depends on what mood he's in and all that stuff. And hopefully, you know, she's, she's realizing, man, if I come in there and he doesn't hold out his scepter in approval, I'm toast. That, that's the law of the land. So it's very dangerous for Esther to even think about going in without being invited to talk to the king. Aren't you glad we have a king whose scepter is always reached out to you? Man, I love that about our Lord, that the Lord is not saying, eh, I don't know. See, if you're a Muslim, you've got to kind of think more like Xerxes. Uh, is Allah going to be happy today or mad? See, Allah is kind of a capricious God in Islam, and you don't know really how he's going to feel and what he's going to do. He can't really be known, good mood or bad mood. That's part of the Islamic faith. But I love how we can know who our God really is. And I love the Lord for that very reason. In fact, it's Hebrews chapter 10 that reminds me of how we can enter into the Lord. It says in Hebrews 10, it says in verse um, 19, it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, uh, from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. And let us consider one another <clears throat> to, to provoke one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Man, I love this. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast and let us consider one another. How can we do this? How can we draw near and come in boldly? Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. That's the, the secret right there. Man, I love that about our Lord. It it's reminds me also in Matthew 11, that classic passage, come unto me all ye that are weary and heavy laden and, and I will give you rest. This is an invitation of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. This is an invitation from our God. Uh, I'm just reminded as I think of, you know, Ahasuerus, this king. Uh, my wife, well, we'll see if I feel like letting her in. Like, that's a horrible thing. 
But that's the king. Uh, that's the way the world is. So Esther's got a kind of a scary proposition. Mordecai's saying, man, you've got to go in and talk to him or else we're toast. Well, so it says in verse 12, they told Mordecai Esther's words, you know, about how dangerous it was for her to go to the king. Then Mordecai commanded to, uh, to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to this kingdom for such a time as this. That's probably the most famous words of the book of Esther, isn't it? Uh, Mordecai saying, Esther, maybe you were brought to this faraway kingdom for such a time as this. Man, what a, what a great line that really is. You know, I love how the Lord does position us right where he wants us. And who knows what he's doing? We don't know. Uh, I, like, I like how Mordecai says, who knows? We don't really know, but maybe, you know, you've been brought. And he doesn't say by God. That's the, that's the thing that's so funny about this. We all, we all think, oh man, Mordecai's saying, God brought you here for such a time as this. And maybe that's what he meant, but he doesn't say that. He says, you, you, maybe you're here for such a time as this. What he's acknowledging is sort of God's providence and his sovereignty, putting Esther in that place for that time. Uh, maybe that was the extent of what Mordecai knew of God in those times. Most of the other Bible characters would have, like Daniel, for example, would have grabbed his buddies and they would have fallen on their faces and sought and prayed to the God of the Jews. And, you know, the book of Daniel is very clear, right? If you remember the story, Daniel seeking the Lord and the Lord answering his prayers. You don't see that in Esther. You see these people who seem to be sort of disconnected a little bit from God, and yet there's still just a little flicker of faith in these people who are so far away, and yet he's acknowledging that there's a sovereign work going on, and, uh, and maybe you were brought here for such a time as this. Do you ever wonder if Esther was like, um, like what, what was her position on being the queen of Persia? Was it like, wow, I won the, the contest, yes, Oil baths for me forever. Food to eat at the king's table. Was she like really happy about it or was she really bummed about it? Did she hate being just one of the many women in this king's, you know, harem? Or, you know, because he had a harem in addition to being his wife. There was a bunch of other ladies involved with uh, King Xerxes as well. And, and, and it really kind of, you know, in, in a lot of our, uh, you know, view, it'd be kind of a sickening kind of thing to have to be a part of. Um, what was Esther's view about why she was there? And this little uh, hint that Mordecai says, it's perhaps reasonable that you are, you've been brought to this place for such a time as this, that gives me the hint that maybe she wasn't all thrilled about being the beauty queen and the queen of Persia. Do you see what I mean there? I think Esther knew uh, of what, what it was and, and also the way Vashti was taken out. I'm sure she always had that in the back of her mind thinking, man, what's this king gonna do? Is he gonna treat me like he treated his ex-wife? I mean, I, I doubt that Esther was like, yes, this is an awesome thing. I'm the queen of Persia. I don't think that's at all. I think this, this woman was far greater in, um, in wisdom and also understanding that where she was at was a tough spot. And she knows that she's even fearing for her life to go and say hi to her husband. And so I believe Mordecai's words were wise. Maybe Esther, you've been brought to this place even though you don't like it, you could almost say, for such a time as this. And the reason that's such an important word, is it really applies to you as well. Maybe you are in that job that you're in right now that you kind of go, man, I don't like this job that I'm in. I, I've been here too long. I've been hanging out with these same old people and they're a bunch of losers. Um, but the Lord might say to you, you know, I've got you there for such a time as this. Maybe the Lord wants you to, to, to be an influence and be light in a dark place. I'll never forget when I was in high school, um, for you high school kids or, or junior hires, if, if you're here tonight, um, I got to tell you, um, things changed for me greatly. I remember my freshman year in high school, I hated it, just hated it, I hated my school, hated that I was in school, I just really d didn't like any part of it. And, um, and then, you know, my sisters who were like good buddies of mine, Jenny and Tammy moved to Southern California. She, you know, Tammy and Jenny were sophomore and junior and then they, they uh, sort of graduated early because they did sort of a homeschool thing and left school, left me 
alone in the public school. And I remember that, that sophomore year, just totally alone by myself. My sisters were gone. They were kind of my lifeline, you know. Uh, but everybody else, you know, and there was a dynamic there. I came from Applegate Elementary. You know, I had like four kids in the school. And so when I, so when I went to Hidden Valley High School, even though it was only a school of like 1,500 kids, like I knew no one, you know. And like I, all the other kids grew up together, elementary school all the way through, and they're all buddies. And it just, I just hated it. Well, I remember when there was a, there was a thing that the Lord just showed me that, that um, it was kind of like this moment. Brett, I've brought you to this school for a purpose. And when my mindset changed and I realized I'm not here for myself or to learn great wisdom from my teachers at Hidden Valley High School or any of that stuff, there was something that kind of clicked in my thinking of saying, what can I do to sort of be a light and to make a difference in the school? And I did stuff that was totally not what I would have normally naturally done. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just going to say I, I looked for every opportunity where I could bring, um, put myself in to bring the Lord in. I joined band. I was played football, did a bunch of sports and, and, you know, became the, you know, varsity letterman president and the president of the school and eventually, you know, did a bunch of stuff. And it wasn't really my nature to do that, but it was, I was just trying to say how much can I get involved and just have access to people so that by the time I graduated as a senior, they asked me to do the, you know, baccalaureate service. And I was like, you know, uh, sharing teachings like I do right here there at, 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 with my high school senior class. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of cool how the Lord used all of those things um, to make kind of a difference. And, and um, it changed the whole thing. It, it's, it went from me hating school uh, to suddenly I had a purpose. And it was kind of like this for such a time as this, Brett. The Lord would say, I got you in this goat roping Hidden Valley High School um, where guys had spittoons on their, you know, dashboard. So they're driving down there, they spit and just let, you know, they're chewing tobacco. I mean, that was where I went to school. But by the time I left, I I had a real love in my heart for um, that school and those people. And and the Lord changed my whole, um, my whole heart and mind. And it was just kind of a neat thing. I wonder if, if this is the thing that gives Esther that, that fuel that she needs to do what she's doing, this, this problem. It's almost like the problems sometimes can become the fuel to get us through. And, and if you as a, a, as a worker or maybe you're at, at, you know, in a school or you're in a place you're like, man, this is such a, hey, I hate this place. Maybe it's time to say the Lord has brought you here for such a time as this. I love that. Oh, what an encouragement from Esther, from Mordecai to give her that word. So, What does Esther do with these words for such a time as this? Mordecai says, well, verse 15, then Esther bade them return, Mordecai, this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Remember, Shushan's the capital city of that whole kingdom uh, right there where the palace is. And fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Hmm. Wow, cousins working together on this one. You know, Mordecai says, man, you gotta do this, Esther. I can't, it's illegal. Do it. The Lord's got you here for such a time as this. Okay, I'm gonna do it, but you guys go and fast, you know, fast for me and don't eat food. And, and, um, and so they're all kind of in working together. Now, um, it's interesting because she says, if I perish, I perish. There's a mindset. It sounds so negative, but you know, um, it reminds me of Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 20, where he said this, he says, now I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and affliction abide me. In other words, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's gonna happen, but everybody's saying I'm gonna be in big trouble when I get there. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Interesting how Paul and Esther alike realized they were in a place where they didn't count their life so dear to themselves, but they were still willing to do what they knew they needed to do. Um, I have a buddy, Peter Thornley. He's kind of a stick, skinny little dude. 
we called him Professor Pete. He used to do like uh, science experiments. When I was a children's pastor, he'd come in and do these science experiments. And, but he was kind of this southern draw, kind of backwoodsy sort of guy. But he was really smart, really, really smart. But he talked kind of like this. It was just kind of a funny blend, Professor Pete. But um, he went to Israel and he was walking down the streets of Jerusalem when he bumped into all these giant men, these big, huge, muscle bound. It was like a whole team of guys. And he thought, I wonder if those guys know Jesus. And so he walked up to them and said, do you guys know Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And, uh, and they said, no. And they walked and, and one of the guys grabbed Peter by the neck and said, if you say the name of Jesus one more time, I'm gonna snap your scrawny neck. And Peter quoted this scripture from Acts 20. He says, well, neither do I count my life dear unto myself. And so I wanna tell you about Jesus Christ. And the guy's like, you know, they're all like getting all in his face and stuff. And Peter's, you know, sweating a little bit. But he, he really thought, I'm going to die here in Jerusalem sharing the gospel. Then all of a sudden, the guys burst into laughter. And as it turns out, they were back in, this is back in the like late 80s when this happened. So it's a long time ago. But it was the power team. Have you guys ever heard of the power? Remember those big Christian guys that went around, you know, with muscles and doing all these feats of strength? They were just messing with them. <laughs> And they said, don't you know who we are? We're the power team. We're Christians. And Peter's like, whoa, man, I thought I was going to die there. For the... so, so for the rest of his time in Jerusalem, they let Peter hang out. So there's all these huge muscular guys and then stick skinny Professor Pete walking around with, with them. But um, anyway, uh, you know, what would happen if you got into that situation? You know, don't say the name of Jesus ever again. Would you count your life dear unto yourself? Um, Esther's at a place where she really has to lay down her life in such a practical way. Um, and this is where the rubber meets the road, right here. So um, that brings us then to chapter five. What happens? Now it came to pass, verse one, on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. That's good news. Um, Because as soon as she appears, if he doesn't hold out his scepter at this point, she's dead. That's what the law said. But she finds favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. Um, Here's a guy who's going, man, she's hot. Um, (laughs) What do you want? I'll give you anything, even up to half of the whole kingdom. <laughs> like, you have to sense this is kind of not such a bright dude. Um, uh, but this is who Xerxes is. Um, so, um, <laughs> so Esther, all she has to do is just stand there. And she's like, I'll give you anything. Um, verse four. And Esther answered, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day into the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste and that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall uh, be performed. So that, you know, she goes in during the day, says, I want Haman, you know, to come and I want to throw a banquet for you. Cool party. And you're going to be there, Esther? Yeah. Bring Haman? Okay. So, it's, so, so now they're here. But here's the thing about this. Why didn't Esther ask just the king in that first visit when he held out his scepter, seems to be in a good mood? Uh, it seems like right then he says, I'll give you up anything up to half the kingdom. But she doesn't pull the trigger on the request there. Why? And, and I think the answer is discernment. Just wisdom and discernment. She somehow sensed it was not time. Um, and you know what? That's something that God wants to give to you and me. It's one of the, you know, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit moving through a Christian is to have a certain discernment. You know, sometimes I think Christians open our mouths too much, too soon, too early. We're all about talking, but sometimes there's a time to be silent and a time to wait. 
And I love Esther for her wisdom here to not just blurt out, well, man, he held out the scepter. Looks like we got green lights. Um, Okay, here it is. But she doesn't do that. She's going to go through quite a bit more before she senses that it's time to make the request to save her, her people, the Jews. Um, so so he's, uh, what, what, the king's like, what do you want me to do? Now they're at the banquet. He, uh, you know, this Haman dude is there and, uh, and, and they're ready to go. And he says, okay, tell me now, what's your request? Then verse seven, Esther answered and said, my petition and my request is, if I have found favor in thy sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. What? Another dinner tomorrow? Okay. You know, it's like, it's like why is Esther delaying? She's already made a nice banquet. Haman's there. All, everybody's there. But she doesn't sense the timing is right. Boy, God's timing, what, a, what an important thing. You know, as a Christian, that's one of the things, as a church, you know, as a church leadership, that's something we pray for often. Lord, we don't wanna get ahead of you, but we also don't wanna lag behind you. We wanna be right in lockstep with you, Lord. Your timing, your plan. Because I've seen where churches and Christians and people, we can get so far ahead of the Lord. And we get into our thing and we think, God told me to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I don't care what happens. And we, we shut off our sensitivity. But the Lord would say, be still and know that I'm God. I love Esther for her wise discernment. And we'll see why the timing is not exact um, in just a minute. So <clears throat> she says, okay, tomorrow I'm going to throw you another banquet. And I really want Haman to be there too. And remember, Haman seems to be buds with the king. Remember after making the edict to kill all the Jews, they're just out, they, they end the story drinking beer together. <laughs> yeah, we got that Jew law signed and they're just drinking. That's what they're doing in, in chapter three. And so the idea of Haman and the king hanging out, this is all pretty normal. But Esther putting on the banquet, that's the different part. Hmm. So verse nine, then went Haman forth that day joyful with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him. Remember, Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman. Um, so, so isn't it funny how, you know, here Haman thinks everything's great, man. I'm, I'm invited to the queen's dinner. I, I think the queen likes me. <laughs> I think she might think I'm hot. Uh, uh, she keeps inviting me to dinner with the king. This is awesome. And then he gets his sort of joy snuffed out when he's riding out to go home. Um, when Mordecai's standing there and then all of his joy immediately leaves him because he's angry at this Jew, this, this little man. It says when Haman saw, verse nine, Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife, And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and the servants of the king. Um, You know, it's interesting because when you have to go and tell everybody of all the great things you've accomplished and have done, you've got a vanity problem. This guy, is, he's like, check this out, man. I'm, I'm like second in command. I'm wealthy and I'm in, you know, large and in charge. And, and he's telling everybody about his good stuff. But you know the old saying, self-conceit is nothing but self-deceit. And you only deceive yourself when you think you're more than you really are. Um, and it's kind of interesting because uh, vanity really at its finest. In fact, check it out. He goes on further, verse 12. And Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared, but myself. And tomorrow I'm invited to her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Now it's interesting because the name Mordecai, you wanna know what that means? Remember, um, Haman means magnificent. Mordecai means little man, (laughs) little man. So you got Mr. Magnificent and Mr. Little Man. Um, The first shall become last and the last shall become first. That's something we should always know about God and the way he makes things happen. 
So uh, Mr. Magnificent saying, man, I'm not gonna be happy. Even about all this great stuff that's happening, the queen invited me multiple times for dinner. Man, this is awesome. Uh, but uh, uh, until Mordecai's dead, I'm not gonna be happy. So this is where Haman's wife gives him some advice. Verse 14, then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. What's this? Okay, the stage is set. Mordecai doesn't, or pardon me, Haman doesn't know that Mordecai is Esther's cousin. Um, but he's gonna, he's gonna ask the king at Esther's banquet, hey, can I hang this guy, Mordecai? He won't bow down to me. He's just one of these Jews that's such a problem. He's a little man who won't bow down to me, Mr. Magnificent. So um, they say, build a, a, a gallows 50 cubits high. Like that's, that's like 60, more than 60 feet high. This huge gallows. Uh, he wanted to make a spectacle of this hanging of Mordecai. So chapter six, verse one, on that night, could not the king sleep? You ever had a night where you can't sleep? Some of you are like, every night. <laughs> if that's you, I'm sorry. I know some people have great trouble with sleep. Um, but, but if you're not a person who normally has trouble with sleep and, and suddenly you can't sleep, sometimes I wonder if that's the Lord just wanting to speak to you and you know, to actually get up and uh, go and read and pray and journal and say, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to show me? I do think the Lord does that sometimes. He'll use a sleepless night to kind of get your attention. And uh, here's this king, he goes to sleep, but, or tries to go to sleep, but he can't. So, uh, so what does he do? So he commanded the, to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. If you want to be put to sleep, just read history. Uh, that's, I think that's, that's what's happening. So he's just kind of reviewing history of his Persian people and what happened in recent news uh, with the Persian news from Shushan. Um, so verse two, it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Tiresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. Um, apparently the king hadn't really heard that these two guys were um, gonna kill him and that Mordecai actually told, told them to warn Ahasuerus about this, this execution that was, a, you know, the, the assassination that was gonna happen. So the king asks, he says in verse three, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? In other words, man, we owe this dude. He saved my life. What, what have we done? You know, do we send him a hallmark or like, what do we do? Well, then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. <laughs> and the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the uh, outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows <laughs> that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman standeth in the court. And, in the, and the king said, let him come in. So, so what's going on? Uh, Mordecai wants, or Haman wants to say, hey, this guy Mordecai's got to die. The king is going to talk to Haman because he wants to say Mordecai needs to be honored. And <laughs> uh, what's going to happen? Well, let him come in. So verse six, Haman came in and the king said unto him, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would be the king's delight to honor more than myself? <laughs> oh boy, this just doesn't get any better. <laughs> He's thinking, okay, the, the, the king wants to honor more. So Haman answered the king, for the man whom the Lord delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king used to wear, and the horse that the king rides upon and the crown of uh, royal which is set upon his head and let this apparel and horse be livered, delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And he's laying it on a little thick, don't you think? Man, this guy is, is vain, vanity. Then the king, verse 10, said to Hanan, Haman, make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, 
and do even to so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate and let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Oh man, you gotta wonder what Haman's thinking at this point. You said what? The guy I was gonna hang on the gallows, you want me to put a royal robe and a crown? This is great. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is their golden rule, man. Uh, Haman's learning this lesson. Verse 11, then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. I wonder if he did it with a pep in his step or if he was a little bit like, ah, say the Lord. You know, I mean, I wonder, I wish I could get that DVD uh, when we get to heaven. Well, verse 12, Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hastened um, to his house mourning and having his head covered. Man, now he's embarrassed, ashamed, covers his head, goes home. And Haman, verse 13, told Zeresh, his wife, all, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, in other words, you want to harm them, thou shalt not prevail against him, but thou shalt surely befall before him. Man, you're in trouble, dude. You, you want to kill someone in the king who's wanting to honor. Verse 14, and while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. There's like, what are we going to do? I don't know, but you're in trouble. Uh, and then they said, it's time for dinner. <laughs> it's like, uh, but what do I do? I'm in trouble. So Haman goes off to dinner uh, with Esther and with Ahasuerus. So verse one of chapter seven. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen, and the king said unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, uh, what is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Now this half of kingdom thing, you have to understand the reason this was said each time, it's, it's like if you're you know, in business and you own 51% of the company, you have controlling you know, shares in the company. And that's kind of the idea. The king knows that you can't give the whole kingdom or else he's not the king anymore. But, um, but by you know, divvying up the half, Esther would not be more powerful than Ahasuerus, but right there. Like she, like that, that's a big thing for him to say, I will give you up to even half of the kingdom um, given to you. Then Esther, verse three, the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given or literally spared me at my petition and my people at my request, for we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and a bondwoman, I had held my tongue. In other words, if we were just being sold off to slavery, I wouldn't even have said anything about this. But these people want to kill us. Um, uh, so I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king, Hazuerus, answered and said unto Esther the queen, who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. I mean, I mean don't you wonder what he was thinking as he's reaching for the celery? You know, it's like, and then this is the one right here. He's like, <laughs> <clears throat> whoops, gulp. Verse seven, and the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Pretty perceptive dude. <laughs> then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine. And Haman was fallen upon the bed wherein Esther was. So picture the scene. Um, you know, the king, has, he's furious, so he steps out to figure out what he's going to do to cool his jets, you know. Meanwhile, the king cools off, and when he walks back in, Haman's fallen on the bed. I, you know, picture the Roman days, you know, where the ladies would lay on the sort of side couch thing, and that was probably the scene, you know. But Haman then jumps on the bed and is begging Esther's, you know, help. But, but then the king walks in, and there's Haman laying on the bed with Esther, and uh, he's like, it's not what it looks like. 
um, you, you know that because of this. He falls on Esther's bed there in the middle of verse 8. And then said the king, will he force the queen also before me in the house? This just takes him over the edge, wouldn't you say? The king's like, what? Are you kidding me? Um, as the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now, this is something that is a Persian thing. You got to study a little bit of history on this one. The, the Persians had a practice when the king said, I'm sick of you. I don't want to see you ever again. They would literally put a bag over your face. They didn't want to see you anymore. And, uh, but it also meant you're dead. Your head is coming off, basically, or, or whatever. You're going to die. So that's the idea of them covering his face, um, you know, literally curtains for him. Um, so verse nine, and Harbona, one of the chamberlains said before the king, behold also the gallows 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, stands in the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Pretty heavy story. Love the story. This kind of reminds me of the A-Team. Did anybody watch the A-Team? There was always like the, the, the plot was the same every single time, but you basically learned the bad guy was really, really bad, like horribly bad. And eventually he would just really get what was coming to him, you know, and that was the end. It was always, always a good story. But this is a real story that happened where the bad guy really got what he deserved. Um, um, now there's so much here that we can sort of learn, and we've already kind of touched on a few things, but one is the wisdom of Esther. I love that she waited on the Lord. The timing was crucial uh, because by the time she waited to that second night of the banquet, that's the timing when the whole thing was happening with Mordecai and the king having the dream and realizing, man, I need to show honor to Mordecai. Like that whole timing needed to be synced up before the perfect plan of sovereign God could actually be unfolded. And I love that Esther was waiting upon the Lord for the right timing. Um, and, you know, I wonder if, um, if, you know, you and I could say, boy, the Lord has given us a challenge, a charge, but the timing. You know, she, she was given the, the job to do. She knew from, you know, talking with Mordecai, man, I got to go in front of the king, risk my life, you know, do this whole request. She knew what she had to do. Um, so she really knew that she had the the that was within her to the power, but she was waiting for sort of the green light, the authority. And a lot of Christians, we have the power. We have the Holy Spirit in us, you know, and, and the Lord is able to work through us. And the Lord gives us his power. But we also have to wait for his authority. Power and authority go hand in hand. You know, you could have a, you know, a, a really fast, you know, car. You know, maybe you're driving one of those new electric Teslas, zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds. And you're there, you've got the power. But you're at a traffic light. And if the traffic light is not green, you don't have the authority. You've got the power, but you don't have the authority. So you need to wait for that green light to have the authority to move ahead at a nice speed. I don't know if it's illegal to go from zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds. I mean, as long as you're not going over the speed limit, right? Um, but anyway, uh, that's the question you have to ask yourself. Lord, you've given us the power by your spirit, but do we have your authority to move ahead, to move forward? And not just to be a knee-jerk reaction Christian. There's a great lesson I see in Esther. And there's so many other lessons. You know, here's truly one of the great women of the Bible, uh, this woman, Hadassah, uh, her Persian name, Esther. Um, I love that. But I also learned, you know, a, a lesson from Haman. Here was a guy who was pretty full of himself. It was all about himself. If you want to be miserable in this life, just focus on yourself. If it's all about yourself, you will be troubled, you'll be upset, and when somebody doesn't treat you very well, you'll be ticked off and it'll ruin everything else. If there's anything good in your life, it'll ruin it because you're bitter about that one person. It's an amazing thing how Haman so much pictures the person who's grown bitter and upset where they can't even see straight. I mean, really, uh, he wants to kill this guy Mordecai, and it gets so crazy, his rage gets so crazy that he ends up saying, I'm gonna kill all the Jews. Like, it's just, he's just crazy with, with anger. You know, you athletes, you know that sometimes, um, you know, getting somebody mad on the opposite team, that's a good thing, because they lose their minds. All their technique goes out the window, you know. 
There's a great story. Uh, George was uh, invited to the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic. George is one of our elders here at the church. And back, you know, they invite like 10 bench pressers around the world. And, um, and you know, you have to be one of the best benchers. And they, they factor in your bench press with your age and your body weight. And then you compete against 10 people. And it's like on ESPN, the whole thing is a big deal. Well, there's this, you know, George has a, had a good lift because he could bench over 600 pounds as a 65-year-old guy. So that all formulas into that whole thing. And, and uh, it was kind of cool. But, but there was this one guy that was, everyone was like, oh, this guy's the strongest man in the world. He was very, you know, one of these guys, pretty, pretty vain, uh, thought the whole world revolved around him. And, and George knew this. So, so they're in the, the warm-up area where people are, you know, setting up their stuff and warming up and, you know, getting ready for the big competition. And, um, and so the guy, this guy comes in with his posse and you know, he's all like, all like this. And George is really calm, you know, he's just a calm guy. Uh, well, this guy's all pumped and his people and they're, they're throwing weights around. Well, this guy takes off his bench shirt and he puts it on a chair and sets it over like the chair next to him and he starts doing all this stuff. And George just kind of walked up and he took his shirt, picked it up and put it on the floor and then walked away with the chair. <laughs> That's all he did. The guy was furious. You know, he's like, like what, what a right does he have to take my chair? Like, it was just take, borrowing a chair. That's all he did. But it was just the right timing with the right, you know. And the guy didn't get one lift the whole day. He was so furious. He, like, never could even, and George won the competition. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's just getting in your head. You're, you know, getting in that. But see, that anger, you know, that, that, that anger that you have because of that person, it can derail you from what God really has for you and maybe even to even enjoy the blessings that God has already given you. It'll ruin all that if you're all hung up with anger, bitterness, and wrath. And literally, Haman ends up totally hung up. <laughs> Don't get hung up on bitterness and wrath. This, 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 this whole thing of vanity and thinking more of himself, this is the path to destruction. It really is. And I think of this story, that's a great reminder for us as well, man, run from that vanity, you know, that, that so often creeps in. And, and, you know, if you don't think more highly of yourself than you should, so when somebody treats you badly, you won't be surprised. If you're surprised when somebody treats you badly, it's probably an indication that you think more highly of yourself than you should. I love the old saying, you know, Gail Irwin uh, used to say, you know, he'd say um, stuff like, uh, you, you know how you're doing it being a servant when people treat you like one. Hmm. Bible teaches us to be a servant. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must become servant of all. That's, that's, and then Paul the apostle, when he talks about his credentials, he had a lot of credentials he could have listed, but oftentimes it's a Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's, that was his credential. And the word servant even sounds beautiful to us as Christians. Oh, I'm just a servant for the Lord. It sounds so lovey-dovey and servant. But the Greek word was doulos, which meant slave. He wasn't saying, I'm a servant, and everybody give him a blue ribbon at church because he called himself a servant. He was calling himself something that the rest of the world said, that's not something to aspire to, to be a slave. Paul says, I am a slave. That is not just a slave, but the doulos was a particular kind of slave. It was a slave by choice. And so what happens when people treat you like a slave? You'll know how you're doing at being a servant when people treat you like one. The opposite of that is Haman, who wanted the glory of men, wanted to be paraded on the horse in front of everybody, you know, wanted to make his Instagram look really, really, really good. Wow, he's got an amazing life. Look at his Facebook and his Instagram. I, I worry about that. Sometimes we, we want to present ourselves as like having it all together, you know. Wouldn't it be funny if our Instagrams and Facebooks were more realistic? Like, take a picture of your face right after you wake up out of the bed in the morning. <laughs> There's me waking up in the morning before I brush my tooth. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Real Facebook, real Instagram. You know, it's funny how we try to present ourselves one way, and that was Haman's whole thing. It was all about himself and his, his, the way he was being treated by others, and he just totally got hung up in the end of the story. I think that's true for all of us. Well, what's going to happen with Mordecai, with the Persian Empire, with Esther, we shall see as we close off the last couple of chapters next, next week. Let's go ahead and finish for the night. And so, Lord, tonight as we um, just kind of think of this amazing story, I pray that we would each and every one of us individually hear the lessons 
that you have for us. Lord, the story just stands on its own so well. It's an amazing story. But Lord, um, we think of fear that people face as Mordecai and Esther really faced legitimate, fearful things. But Lord, you were there sovereignly intervening and taking care of your people. Even though they were very far from you and not really linked to you there in the land of the Persian Empire. But you still had them. Lord, I pray that those that are facing fearful things tonight, that they would put their trust in you. That they, Lord, each person here and listening to this study might truly find that peace that passes understanding and that they would lean on you with all of their might, Lord. Your word reminds us to put our trust in you and not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you and then you will make our path straight. Father, I pray that we would trust in your providence, your provision, that you are sovereign. I pray, Lord, that you would, even as the Jews were hated by Haman and these people, Lord, I pray even today as the world largely is angry at the Jews and there's news even today of of skirmishes and fighting and anger, but Lord, we do know that you love your people and you have a plan and a purpose for them. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray that that, um, you would come and rule and reign from the throne there in Jerusalem as you promise in your word. Lord, we put our trust in you for that. I pray, Father, that we would bloom with our lives wherever you plant us. Lord, you tell us that um, Esther was put there, even as Mordecai indicated, for such a time as this. And we see how you used her and used her beauty. While other people might use beauty for other things, we see how you used Esther's beauty for a much greater purpose. I pray for the talents and the giftings that each person has in this room and that they would see what purpose it is that you've given them those giftings and those talents. And that rather than just gloating like Haman, help us to realize, Lord, why you've given us those gifts and how you want us to use them. Give us an openness, Lord, to being used even to greater measure. So Lord, so many lessons, so many things to to glean from. And now, Lord, I pray that you'd bless each of these, your people, taking this Wednesday night, time to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen.